Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, good morning, folks. Um, I'm delighted to be back in business as far as uh, my illness is concerned. Um, and uh, I'm happy to be with us uh, today specifically to talk about some of the uh, additional material um, that I'd like to cover on the uh, functor part. Um, we're going to be covering some additional aspects of uh, functoriality uh, today and going in a little bit more detail into a uh, an example uh, motivated by some of the 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 um, the work presented by David Spivak uh, and Brendan Fong as part of the MIT course on category theory, uh, as well as by some of the uh, supporting videos I, I sent where those ideas are, are explicated um, from a slightly different perspective uh, in other contexts by David Spivak. Um, now, uh, today's session, because it's coming several weeks after the last uh, foundational session on on uh, functors. Um, I'm also going to use uh, just to review the the basic concepts about these uh, structure preserving transformations uh, mappings between categories. Um, uh, as time allows, I'm also going to be talking about some aspects of uh, the database uh, perspective on categories or database applications of categories, which um, uh, there wasn't time to really incorporate into the MIT course. Um, and uh, we'll see uh, that those end up providing a little bit of a, of a motivation for uh, the introduction of the notion of a contravariant functor, um, something which is very important in, in many areas of application um, uh, and uh, within the programming context uh, tends to come up a fair bit. Um, also in the context of pro functors, uh, HOM functors, and, and many other common beasts within category theory. Um, we're going to uh, be talking about data transformations, transformations between instances of databases. Um, uh, from a database with one sort of structure to a database uh, with another sort of structure. And uh, as we'll see, uh, functors play a key role in this, but we'll also have a sneak preview of a very important topic near and dear to my heart, which is uh, adjunctions. Um, and adjunctions in turn um, uh, will, uh, will provide a, a gateway uh, to start thinking about monads. Um, adjunctions in the context of databases will provide this um, consistent framework for mapping back and forth, if needed, in sort of a synchronizing way between two different database schemas. Um, so you might have a database schema encoded by category C and another one encoded by category D, and um, you need to, to transfer data back and forth between them, not merely export from D to C, but uh, but go back sometimes um, to to D, uh, reflecting data that's been accumulated, and uh, we'll see that uh, adjunctions um, in in this way by providing a sort of mutually consistent um, uh, characterization of of um, common um, common structure within two different categories provide us a very convenient way for understanding such uh, bi-directional data transformations. Um, now, uh, today's session, I had noted in um, my uh, email to people yesterday, unfortunately it has to be truncated at 11.30 due to a really stiff uh, constraint I have. I have to hightail it across town. Um, and uh, I'm gonna have to apologize for uh, for, for needing to bow out like that. I think what we'll try to do is use the opening of our next session to, uh, to answer batched up questions, uh, go through any questions arising from the exercises from this material. I'm hoping that some of those questions might be dealt with by 
the particular concrete examples we're seeing today, or at least that those will provide a point of reference for understanding some of these concepts that might have been elusive. Um, but um, I think we'll we'll try to reserve the first part of our next session, so that should be next week, um, uh, barring any uh, sudden decline on health on my part, um, to go over to go over uh, those questions. So. Be sure to store those up. If we can get to some today, that would be great. But otherwise, we'll we'll look to uh, to next week. Um, so, uh, without further ado, I'm just going to switch over to uh, my slides here, and uh, we're going to be going back and forth uh, between slides uh, mostly today, and then some use of Blackboard um, probably on occasion, and uh, we'll we'll try to do that in a more artful way than we were able to in the first few sessions. Okay, can you folks uh, see my slides right now? Okay, okay, great. Um, so uh, I had sent these slides. I, I actually didn't have time to make uh, further changes uh, to you last night. Um, so hopefully you have, you know, some basis for uh, for navigating them. Um, you know, the core reflection here from, from my perspective is, is, is on uh, databases as structured quantities. Um, uh, we might think of a database informally, or perhaps the popular conception of a database is kind of this cacophony of data, this jumbled heap of data. Um, but that does a, a real disservice to the fact that um, uh, databases are, in fact, um, highly structured in their characterization of the data. And it's not just they're structured to kind of store the data in, in efficient forms, um, although they're, they're very much geared towards that, you know, using B trees or what have you to, to store it efficiently on, on, on disk. Um, but um, but it's uh, the fact that they're organized in a fashion that's self-consistent, that um, certain invariants are adhered to. Um, uh, there are certain, you know, rigorous uh, properties that are guaranteed that allow us, in turn, to secure certain optimizations safely, um, to be able to, 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 to take advantage of certain of these invariants uh, in order to say, execute queries faster or um, perform updates faster. And there's a whole intricate structure that is put in place for efficiencies. But in this area, as in many other spheres, whether it's modeling or, or operating systems or, um, or compilers or in, in programming languages, we secure efficiencies by taking advantage of the the structure knowing these invariants allows us to to undertake oper uh, undertake optimizations knowing that they're going to be safe. So databases um, do exhibit you know massive quantities of data, but they do so in a way that that stays true to certain consistent guarantees. And um, and that's within a database. But when we consider uh, taking that data and uh, placing it into other forms, whether it's queries like we might issue as analysts day to day, or whether it's um, moving stuff back and forth to other databases. Um, we, we seek to maintain um, rigor and do so by exploiting these these invariants that uh, are captured in the database, um, and so when we migrate from one database to another, when we under undergo an extract, transform, and load, when we create views or we put in place a data cube for for warehousing for fast analytics, uh, or when we want to evolve our schemas, um, all of these, uh, you know, uh, are are best undertaken and are only really safely undertaken when our uh, our manipulation of the data stays true to the guarantees. For example, um, uh, these these invariants that that specify, for example, uh, certain relationships 
that are guaranteed to ob observe between multiple tables, um, these constraints in place in the database. Um, and in as much as databases uh, provide a, uh, a beautiful example of, of the power of, of uh, uh, structure, uh, structural guarantees for, um, for efficient operations, uh, th they also turn out to be uh, to be very nice little test cases or exemplars of categorical reasoning, um, and and a lot of the things we look to for databases as far as guarantees have their their cate uh, their um, category theory analogs, um, say, say in terms of compositionality or associativity or what have you. Um, and uh, categories provide this way to, to capture structure, structure. I mean, so much of category theory is just about this notion of, of capturing, preserving, maintaining, and exploiting structure. Now, within this context, um, functors play a particularly important role. Um, and uh, one of the motivations for going into the, this topic of, of databases early on in this uh, discussion group was because you can appreciate databases with a basic understanding of categories and functors without getting into, without requiring as a fundamental prerequisite uh, material uh, on uh, natural transformations or material on uh, monads or adjunctions or material on profunctors, um, material on con extensions. It turns out that all those beasts um, have their place within the database uh, ecosystem more broadly. And if you understand those, you'll be able to understand this area particularly well. But they're not required for the basic canon of, of, of how databases are captured categorically. Um, and uh, <clears throat> that that key canon is expressible in some simple ways. And, and if you watch those videos, you would have found David Spivak and Brendan Fong um, characterizing some simple principles by which we relate, on the one hand, databases, uh, database schemas, say, and categories, or database instances and, and uh, schemas and, and functors associated with them, schemas mapping, a database schemas represented a category mapping via a functor the structure preserving transformation to set. And the idea here is that, um, you know, we have within a category objects and morphisms. And objects are, are not quite as, as, as central as morphisms. Category theory, like system science, is all about the interconnections. And, and that's morphisms are, are where that's at. Um, objects. Well, you know, often we'll collapse objects that are isomorphic and we'll have fewer objects, but, but we've captured the essential properties of objects as far as their connectivity. So, it, so don't, we don't mind that. Um, so objects are, are there, but they're, they play a little bit of second fiddle, as it were, to, to the morphisms, to these relationships. And here, objects represent tables in the database, and morphisms represent... Um, well, if they're between two different objects, foreign key relationships. Uh, I say foreign key, but um, in principle, there's an identity transformation that, that involves an identity morphism for every object, which involves the primary keys. Um, and a category captures these, these, um, these uh, familiar database constructs, um, tables and, foreign, and, and keys, um, within objects and morphisms and database instances are associated with these functors these structure preserving mappings mapping objects to objects and morphisms to morphisms between two categories and what are those categories well one is a category representing the schema of this particular database and um and the other category to which the mapping is done is set of uh, the category of sets and functions um and functions between them Database transformations from one database to another can be identified as with universal constructions. And it's things like pullbacks, uh, for example, 
or 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 the types of um, uh, constructions you get with adjunctions uh, limits that that are associated with uh, database transformations and um, bidirectional database migration I mentioned is associated with adjunctions um, so uh, uh, you know, I, I'd like to start explicating these, and, and I'm going to go into a reminder on functors once we get to um, needing to, to rely on them for this narrative. But at first, I'd like to talk about uh, uh, an example database. Um, you would have seen one of them in David's various talks, uh, which I uh, suggested you watch. Apologies for the English lapse, um, but um, I, I have a, a different one in mind here, um, which brings out a, some a little bit of additional structure. Um, so we have tables. We're going to have three tables, patient, physician, and ward. This is a hospital ward. Um, and um, we're going to have, within each of those tables, uh, some foreign key relationships. Um, I'm not going to concentrate on the particular features of the patient, you know, their health card number, etc. There's a there as well. Um, but um, uh, I'd like to concentrate more on those that are uh, that are mapping as foreign keys, things like uh, the responsible physician for a patient. So each patient is going to be associated with a, a, a column conceptually, which gives their responsible physician. The physician is responsible for their care in that ward. Um, and then a ward in which, um, in which they're present. And each physician is going to be associated with a particular ward, we'll imagine. Obviously, we're oversimplifying the things when it comes to many hospitals. And a given ward is going to have one attending physician. It's going to have one senior physician who's responsible for that um, and kind of uh, is the point of ownership of, of um, the different the different types of caregiving relationships delivered by different physicians in that ward. Um, so these are our tables, patient, physician, and ward, and each of them has one or more relations, one or more links um, via these foreign keys to other tables. Um, and we're going to have some data integrity constraints. So, you know, we might have something like this where each patient is, um, uh, that's odd. I thought I colored uh, these in a nice way, but um, uh, no matter. So, so for patients, we, we all have a primary key column, uh, unique, of course. This is part of the guarantees of a database, the invariance. We never have more than one row, which has a given value of the primary key. Um, and here the the physician foreign key pointing off to those tape uh, to that table and the ward foreign key pointing off to the ward table now um, these are our sets of data and there's already guarantees or constraints uh, captured in that but there's some additional constraints captured as well and particularly in the form of, of data integrity constraints uh, these uh, relationships between the tables um, say between the um, the ward associated with a patient and who their physician is have to be have to play nicely with they have to be consistent with um, th what's encoded in different tables so for example if a patient has a certain physician um, and that patient is more over in a certain ward surely that physician has to be in that ward themselves. Um, that would be implied. So for, for all patients P, a patient's ward sh needs to be the same as their physician's ward. Um, so if we consider the ward of the patient directly, or we consider who their physician is and look what ward those are, those need to be, be the same. And so there's a, a data integrity constraint here, right? Um, and there's there's uh, one other as well um so for all wards the uh, attending physician in that award uh, in that ward needs to be assigned to that same ward so uh, there's there's this uh need for consistency between what's in different tables 
need need for them to um, have a coherent, consistent view of the underlying situation. And these data integrity constraints, as we'll see, will come out in the form of composition rules, rules involving morphisms. So um, I drew this on the board um, that abuts me, and um, it was actually in Technicolor. Um, we we had um, for Ward down there. Uh, we had a blue color, um, and for Physician we had a green color. But somehow it's been washed out, and I apologize for that. Um, but the way in which this maps by this sort of rules here, where look objects are tables. So if we want to represent this the database schema as a category, we're going to create a table. Uh, for each table, we'll, create, we'll define an object. And for each foreign key relationship, we'll define a, a morphism between different objects. And then there'll be some morphisms, which are identity morphisms, um, which go from, from one object uh, back to itself. Not every morphism in general that's a self-morphism, goes from an object to itself, um, is, is an identity, but those will be identity ones, okay, the, the primary key relationship. So, so we'll have, for example, patients, and we said each table here is an object, so patient, physician, ward, patient, physician, ward. I've shown the objects in an ungainly large fashion. Um, and then each morphism or each foreign key relationship between two different objects is captured through a morphism between those objects. So for example, this relationship from a patient to a physician is associated with a mor morphism, which I've labeled in a rather unimagined fashion as, as lowercase physician. Um, and uh, that's gonna map uh, from a patient, the, the keys for a patient to the keys for a physician. It's gonna provide, a, it's gonna be associated with a when we when you take it through a, a functor to a set, it's going to be associated with a mapping a function that maps from patient IDs to physician IDs. Um, but right now it's just a morphism here, and we have similar morphisms for this attending one and this ward one. Okay, and because we have two ward designations, I've I've taken the liberty of labeling one as ward PT. That's the ward column associated with the patient. And then there's a ward column associated with the physician shown here. So we, we have this network of relationships here captured in a, um, at a first order within this category um, as shown on the, the diagram here and shown in the, in the uh, blackboard. Um, and that's a good start, but there's something missing from this just by itself. Um, what, remember when we, we specify a category um, it's not just we specify the, the objects and the morphisms. We need to specify some additional guarantees, but uh, what I'm after right now is some additional uh, properties involving how to interpret composition. And in this case, the, there'll be composition rules which um, tell us how uh, any two morphisms, any two of these arrows compose. So for example, if we have a physician um, a morphism and a ward uh, for associated with a given physician, and we compose those, um, um, what's the, the composition? And what I want to highlight here is that it's these composition rules that are going to uh, that are going to encode these data integrity constraints, okay? Um, so these data integrity constraints that say, for example, for all physicians, um, there, if we look at the ward, sorry, for all patients, if we look at the ward associated with the patient, that's the same as the patient's physician's ward. Um, we can encode this here. So if we consider, um, for example, the um, uh, the ward associated with um, uh, a, a patient. So we, we consider this morphism, ward PT from patient to ward. Um, 
that morphism needs to be the same morphism produced by composing two things by first undertaking a mapping to physician and then undertaking the mapping undertaking the mapping from that physician to the ward um, through the ward associated with that physician those two have to be the same so if we compose physician and ward uh, for that physician we need to get the same morphism as going directly to ward patient so we're describing two different ways around the circle and they need to commute is the word for it um, they need to these two different ways have to give the same result we get to the same ward um, as a result okay um, so that uh, is describing it for this first one this data integrity constraint ended up coming out in this rule for composition of the the corresponding morphisms um, um, associated with these uh, foreign key relationships so that's that's um, one example uh, this other one it's similar so if we have a given award and we um, consider the attending and the ward associated with the attending it's got to be the same ward so again if we have a uh, a given given ward and we consider the identity morphism doesn't change anything it just stays at the ward maps each ward to itself um uh that that morphism needs to be the morphism returned by on the other hand going from that ward asking who the attending is and then asking who their ward is so this attending ward ph if we compose those we need to get back the same morphism it has to be the same morphism that's a result of composing those as if we had just stayed there with the identity okay um so uh here we're um we're examining this uh this mapping uh, uh between pairs of morphisms and in the results of their composition and we see that it encodes these uh these constraints um all other ones not constrained through this uh i haven't spelled them all out um but uh but we might assume that uh they they um are free to 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 not be the same and let's consider one of these um so let's consider a situation where we have a ward for example so we we consider a physician and we say what's the ward associated with that physician and that brings us from physician to ward and then we ask who's the attending there does that have to be the same as id for physician so that's a, a question for you that i'd like to pose now so if i consider a physician um for example and i ask what ward are they in and i ask who's the attending is that always going to be the same as that physician the original physician well in general the answer is no there's nothing about our database that that we want to impose that constraint it has to be the same we want to allow for wards which have multiple physicians and in fact there are some wards like ward one here which have mul have to have multiple uh, uh physicians associated with them but only one of them is the attending so if we considered a, a certain physician let's say physician two and we ask who their ward what in what ward they're located and we look up who the attending is in that ward that's not necessarily that same initial physician physician two we actually will see the round tripping it we'll get back physician one so yeah yeah please mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. oh. right oh i see mm mm right uh, 
No, it, it would be that physician um, is bound. I'm assuming here that they are permanently bound in a most uh, bonded fashion to that ward. So th thanks. That, that's a good question. And you're absolutely right that um, um, it would probably sharpen this if I made that constraint clear that I'm assuming physicians and wards are have this sort of permanent link and that a given physician is only in one ward. Um, but in general, one could extend this uh, this uh, principle to uh, to handle the case you're mentioning. Thanks. That's a good question. Any other questions on this example? Yes, please. Great. Uh, this one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, okay, good question. So I'm going to answer that um, uh, in two ways, okay? Because um, uh, you might be asking two somewhat different questions, and I want to address both of them because they're both reasonable questions. Okay, so one question is, is it a redundant constraint? Um no, it isn't redundant because in general for a category, um, to, to have a, a real category, we, we need to specify for any, a rule for composition, for any two morphisms that are compatible in the sense that A goes to B, you have a, the first morphism goes from A to B and the second goes from B to C. That's what I mean by compatible. They you know, the, the target of the first is the same as the source of the second. Um, if they're compatible, we, we need to specify, to, to have the category fully um, defined, we need to specify the, um, uh, the composition of, those, uh, of that pair. And uh, sometimes we're a bit sloppy about it by, by just saying, well, you know, it, 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 we, we informally describe it. So with like the A factors B and B factor C, we kind of say, well, okay, it means A factor C. And, and um, it, it comes out, uh, you know, directly that, that if you have those mathematically, A factors B and B factors C, then A cleanly factors C. Um, uh, but, um, but we're still specifying it just in a, in a sort of sloppy informal way. And in general, we, we need to specify what this composition means. This is, this is going to be seem kind of strange sometimes um, if you only understand sets and functions where composition is function composition. Some of the motivations for needing to specify these things are not clear because you think it's obvious. But we'll be dealing with many categories where um, morphisms do not mean functions and composition of morphisms is not the same as composition of functions and when we get to monads we'll see for example with Claisley categories um in a Claisley category we'll have a arrow from a to b it's a morphism from a to b a good enough morphism but it will correspond to a morphism in the base category of a to a monad of b um and we can't just compose them in a in a kind of naive way because um, we'll have a to monad of b and b to monad of c and and that second morphism doesn't take in a monad of b uh it takes in a, a b um and they'll need to be an extension rule so in general we have to specify a rule for composition how we compose things what does composition mean for things um and and here, a key part of composition is that we have to specify um, for any two morphisms that are compatible and physician to, so the physician morphism from patient to physician and the ward pH morphism from physician to ward, uh, to ward those are compatible in the sense that they're end to end, right? The, the, the target of one is the source of the next. Um, and we need to specify a rule for, for what they compose to. Now, here we're imposing the constraint that physician and ward pH have to compose to ward PT. 
if we didn't specify that in general for a diagram like this, um, it wouldn't be assumed. And, and this is an important point because if you start watching category theory um, uh, talks or you, you see a lot of material, you see a lot of cases where there's commuting diagrams that if you go around this way, it's the same as going around that way. You have commuting squares, for example. But not all squares are commuting. Not all triangles are commuting. Not all um, instances where you go two different paths to the same point are commuting. Um, and you know, if I want to go from um, here to um, uh, to downtown, um, I can I can assure you the different paths from here to downtown Saskatoon don't commute because uh, some of them will go over a nice bridge and some will end me up in the drink. Um, it'll, it'll end me up in the river. Um, and those will not commute. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I will be in very different states arriving in downtown Saskatoon if I go through the river or if I, if I go over a bridge. And in general, in our categories, two different ways of going from, um, from uh, a source to a destination uh, don't commute. We can't assume that they commute. And um, and so therefore, when we do specify that, it's a very um, special sort of situation. It's a special constraint. It's a it's it's a reflection of the structure of the problem that we've captured, that that we can specify this thing. Um, and so just because they compose end to end to go to war doesn't mean that they're going to commute. They're going to be the same morphism as Ward P, uh, PT here. Now, this may seem a little bit disconnected, but if we think about mapping this to set, where physician is a function, if we map this to set, the category of sets and functions between those sets, physician here will be mapped to a function in the category of sets and functions. It will be mapped to a, a function um, from patient, primary key, to physician primary key. Um, it'll say for each patient, who's their physician um, uniquely, right? Um, and ward PH will be mapped to one that specifies for each physician, physician so-and-so, who their, what their ward is, what, what, what's the idea of the ward. Um, that's a function. And if we think about composing those functions, um, that will give us a function. In, because composing functions end to end, if we have F going from, you know, uh, B to C, and we have uh, G going from A to B, and we can take F of G of whatever, and we'll have something that goes A to C. Um, if we compose those functions, physician award pH in set, we're not necessarily, unless we tell it, like unless we impose a constraint, that won't necessarily be the same as ward PT. So we could imagine a version of this database where um, the ward here over in patient was jumbled. You know, we put in, eh, we just, you know, throw in any sort of garbage. You know, we put in, um, for example, um, uh, W3 for, for patient one, right? Um, or we put in ward two, let's say for patient one, so we don't put something out of bounds there. Um, we put in ward two. And now we'd have something that, um, I mean, it will store it, but it won't observe this constraint, um, this first constraint. And so we get a weird situation. It wouldn't be natural. It wouldn't be consistent. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't give a consistent picture of the word because we're saying there's patients in ward two, but they are assigned to a physician who's only in ward one. Um, and, and and that just wouldn't jibe. It, it, it wouldn't make sense. But um, there may be other cases where there's no constraints um, and we don't have to uh, have one. And in fact, I'm, I, I'm, I introduced one here. So for example, if we round trip from physician, think about a given physician's, their ward, and then they're the attending on that ward, that doesn't have to be the same as the physician. That's a round trip path path from physician to ward and back. So 
you might think it has to be the identity, but it's not the case. Because if we consider a resident physician um, or even a, a, a physician in training, a medical student, um, and we we take their ward and we ask who the attending is, it doesn't have to give us that the identity function that tells us, you know, they are themselves. Um, it, it could give a, another mapping. And so if that helps, think of them as functions by thinking about what they would become when we map them to set. Um, I think you'd find that that in general, we can't assume that just two different ways of getting to the same place yields um, the same results, like two different ways, staying at physician with the identity is not the same as going to, from physician to ward and back to, to physician. That's, those are not the same morphisms. Those are not the same functions if we're thinking about map to, mapping this to set. And, and, um, but in other cases, they are. Like if we ask um, for, we consider a ward and we ask who the attending is, that has to be someone who's assigned to the ward. So that's one level at which I'm answering your question. Now there's a second level, which is maybe what Zashan actually meant was, do we need to draw the morphism here on the board in this diagram, um, which is characterizing this, um, this category? Do we need to draw ward PT? Maybe that's redundant and therefore by the rules of Hasse diagrams, the sort of diagram we're using to, to characterize this um, category, maybe we shouldn't draw ward PT because we don't draw things that are implied. Um, and, um, and, you know, that is probably true. Um, we don't, as long as we had a specification of the category, if we drew it, we wouldn't draw ward PT because it would be implied by the other two, uh, what it has to be. So we know that there's, a, that there's a, a mapping there and we know what it has to be. It has to be physician in ward PH. Um, and so we might drop drawing it. I don't know if that's helpful, sir, Sean. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Hmm. Yeah. Mm. 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 Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. That is really interesting. Thank you, Alex. That's, um, um, I'd like to chat some other time about that. That's that's quite interesting to me, and I can see what you're saying. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Great. Right. Um... Yeah, no, no, that that's helpful. Yeah, I was talking about a category theoretic um, convention of not drawing um, arrows, um, but uh, you know, from a database standpoint, we might want to indicate that there is a foreign key, you know, associated with it. Um, and as Alex said, though, if you define the foreign keys involving the physician, that's another matter. Okay, um, so. Um, I, I, I welcome these uh, these comments. I do want to move you know, a little bit further on here. Um, so, so this is um, characterizing a database uh, schema. I, I used example tables for a database instance to motivate this some or to make it concrete. But 
ultimately what we're trying to capture here is a database schema in the form of a very here informally described category. Um, now, um, in order to relate that database schema <coughs> to underlying data to a database instance for that schema, um, we need to introduce the notion of, of uh, functors. And uh, particularly, um, if we have a database encoding category, C, uh, a functor from C to SAT instantiates that database schema in a database instance, okay? It, it actualizes, it materializes that schema. Um, and, uh, uh, and an object in the table uh, within this context is mapped by the functor. Well, remember, there's an object for every table, right? Um, and each of those objects is mapped to what? Well, it's mapped to set. Well, what set is it mapped to? Because remember, in set, is a category of sets and functions between them. The objects are sets. So each object, if we have a functor from C to set, each object in C has to go to an object in set, which is a set. Um, and so an object uh, representing a table is mapped to the set of its primary keys, okay? Um, and uh, a morph, so for example, um, here we have these tables and patient here will be mapped to PT01, PT02, PT03. Those are the primary keys there. Um, uh, and physician would be mapped to these primary keys. Um, and ward would be mapped to these primary keys, okay? Um, that's the action of a functor on the objects, where the objects here are the tables. So functors map are structure-preserving mappings. Mark my words, structure-preserving mappings. Mapping objects to objects. So here are objects in C to objects in set, which are sets. Oops. Um, sets of primary keys in that case and morphisms to morphisms. So we have to consider morphism. What does the functor do on morphisms? People can often get distracted by, you know, the action of the functor on objects, and, and, and that's good, but the fun action of the factor on morphisms is often more interesting. Often that gets to the heart of, of um, the action of a functor. And um, here, morphisms in C are mapped into morphisms in set. And what are morphisms in set? Can anyone say? What are the morphisms in the category set? By the way, you notice it's bold. That means the category set. What are morphisms in set? They are functions. They are functions. So each morphism, which is here, the foreign key relationship, right? From, from one object to another, it's a foreign key relationship, is mapped to a function from one set to another set. Um, and it's being mapped from the primary keys of A to the primary keys of B, if it's a morphism from A to B. Um, uh, so this is a function. And it's going to specify for each primary key of the source table, say a patient, who is the physician associated with that patient. Mm -hmm. It's a function from patient to physician. It says for every patient who, it's for each and every patient, it gives one and exactly one physician. No repeats, no forgetting about patients. It's a total function. Um, so remember we have this. And so action of the functor <coughs> on morphisms is, uh, is is given as follows. So if we consider this morphism, oh, come on, um, this morphism here, um, uh, we're going to be mapping from patient 01 to physician 01. Why is that? Well, patient 01 has physician 01, and that's exactly uh, through this foreign key relationship we're dealing what we're dealing with there. 
Um, uh, here we're mapping from patient 02 to physician 02. That's, that's this one here. And patient 03 to physician 03. Sorry, I was rather unimaginative, and I'll, I'll try to do better next time in the, the naming here, um, or have a bigger repertoire. Uh, and similarly, this ward PT, this guy here, um, whoa, sorry, um, mapping patient 01 to ward 1, patient 2 to ward 1, and patient 3 to ward 2, and, and lo and behold, that's exactly what, what this is, right? Um, and, uh, and so the mapping of the morphisms into set give us exactly this, uh, this function relationship um, that we captured uh, in the context of the foreign keys of these, these tables, um, these table rows. So uh, here we have functions being defined by virtue of this functor from this category uh, over to set. And those functions need to be consistent. So when we said earlier that we have these data integrity constraints and we consider, for example, for a given patient, their ward, and we consider their physician and their ward by composing those functions, we have to get the same function. So let's see that, right? For, for a given patient, this is the function relating them to a ward. And what I'm saying is that this constraint here, uh, where we, if we look, can be captured in considering for a patient their physician with this function and Post-composing that function, if we map with this function and then map and turn with this function here, if we compose those two functions, we will get back a function. And it should be the same function as this one. It's got to be the same. It's got to be consistent into how it tells you know a given patient to what ward they go and what ward they're placed. Okay, so... Um, that's about composition of the functions here. Um, and the thing is that a functor is a structure preserving mapping. So if it's mapping from this category, what, in performing that mapping, as we heard last time, it has to, it doesn't just map willy nilly the various um, uh, morphisms, right? Uh, it captures the structure of the situation. So, so objects are mapped to objects. Morphisms from object A to, morph to, to object B are mapped to a, a morphism, some morphism from, from the image of A to the image of B. In, in other words, if, if, if it maps patient to F of patient, and phys the morph if the functor maps patient to F of patient and physician to F of physician, then a morphism from uh, between patient and physician, the physician morphism has to be mapped to a morphism in, in set between uh, F of patient, um, the set representing patient keys and, the, and F of physician, the set representing physician keys. Um, it, has to rep it has to be mapped to, to a function between those two. Not only that, but remember, what else does does the functor have to respect as it's applied to morphisms? What else does the functor have to guarantee is is conserved, is is invariant, is is uh, assured? Anyone? There's there's two two things that that functor, when applied to morphisms, have to guarantee for it to be a legitimate functor, to be structure preserving. What are those? Uh, yeah, it has to respect composition. So with a functor, um, if we have, uh, if we have uh, two compatible maps uh, in, in C, um, a G from C to D, and, um, oh my, my God, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, um, oh my gosh, uh, I don't know how this, what? Um, 
Okay. Um, yeah. So, so we want f after g. So this should be. Whoa. Okay. I I don't know how that wacko thing got in there. Um, g be sub from b to c, and uh, f is from a to b. Then um, the functor applied to the composition of these two morphisms, which is something from a to c, has to be the same as the composition of the functor applied to G and the functor applied to F. Um, so we need to provide these guarantees. So if we have this, for example, and uh, the functor has to be such that if we have, if we map, for example, physician over into that, uh, into set, and then we map ward pH into set, and we compose those, that's what this is. Uh, we map one and then we map the other and we compose them. It has to be the same as composing them in this category and then mapping. So it has to be the same as composing them in these category. Physician and ward pH, they compose to what in this category? Anyone? They compose to, what did we say over here? They they compose to what? Ward PT. There it is. There's the composition rule. It's right there, right? If we compose these guys in in this category, we're going to get this. And if then we map that, that has to be the same as mapping physician, then mapping ward PH and, and composing them in set. So there's this there's this kind of uh, consistency that's required there. That's exactly what this says. Either we compose, we map physician, and then we map um, ward pH and compose them, and we get some some function by which they're composed. That has to be the same function as if we compose them in that category, uh, which is ward PT, and then we map that they have to be the same. So it has to observe, it has to preserve, it has to, it has to honor composition, uh, a functor. Um, and there's something else that a functor has to honor, which is, is identity. So if it maps identity on patient, a uh, functor, if, it ma if it's given a function which takes a patient ID, returns the same patient ID, that has to go to an identity function over in, in set, okay? So an, an identity morphism here, which is not drawn, but always exists for any given object, has to be mapped to an identity function in, in, in this case in set, okay? It has, the, the functor has to preserve it as identity. So these are guaranteed to be preserved, these composition rules. Uh, as a, uh, as a uh, key part of being a functor. To be a legitimate functor, you have to preserve composition, just as, as Sean said. Okay, um, so, um, blah, 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 blah. Um, right, um, so uh, those composition rules have to be honored. And if you look here, they are honored. They're consistent. Um, but if the data was in there willy-nilly, they wouldn't be. Um, it's because this data may look like a cacophony of data, but it whispers to you of hidden structure. And this is the hidden structure that's in there, that's implicit uh, in there, and that's always observed. And that's going to be captured in the action of this functor and mapping these to functions, okay? Um, so, um, that, that's guaranteed by having a functor. Functor are these structure-preserving mappings. Uh, and so if we have a database schema that describes a database, any instance of the schema is created by a mapping from that schema, defining category C, over to set, that instance is guaranteed is guaranteed to observe these constraints. 
whatever primary keys we have, however billions of patients we have, or thousands of physicians, whatever, um, um, and, and given these, um, it, it, there, there's going to have to be an observation of compositionality. The functor guarantees that. So we will have data that observes these rules, that stays true to these rules, exhibits fidelity to these rules, honors these rules um, uh, when we map it map it into to its set there, okay? So, so the functors provide these guarantees about database instances honoring um, the, the rules associated with them. So we're never gonna have a database created by that functor that would have ward two for patient one because that would violate those constraints. It would imply that those functions um, uh, here are, um, are not consistent. That would violate this. And, and the functor preserves this. It honors this rule um, by virtue of honoring composition. Um, okay, so those are some comments there. I would like to, and I'm conscious of time here, um, I would like to talk a little bit about data migration here. Um, okay. Um, we need, um, wh when, we, wh when we consider um, databases, um, while we might think of a database as its own world, often some of the biggest uh, value in, in a business context um, uh, for databases uh, takes place, say, between companies when one, one uh, a company's database, for example, might be extracted some small part of it for a supplier of, of goods so that uh, the supplier of goods is, um, is notified of salient information they can use to, in their uh, supply chain um, operations to provide the company with its needs. Um, or maybe we have analysts that as part of their work need to do queries, need to undertake queries. Um, and those queries need to return results that are reflective of and, and honor the structure of the database. Um, will give meaningful results. Um, so often, while we might think of data in a database as somehow static, as a big hunk of data sitting there, in fact, um, often it exists in motion, it, it's transformed. And we need those transformations to be undertaken in ways that are, that stay true to the data. Um, and to be undertaken in ways that are conscious of the fact that sometimes we may need to render the data in different forms where there's not enough data to fill in consistently what's needed and we need some principled way of dealing with um mis data that can't be filled in directly or what have you um and the key construct here turns out to be functors as well these structure preserving mappings from objects to objects and um morphisms to morphisms um and it turns out that this variant of functors that is going to be very important in coming sessions called contravariant functors uh, also play a big role here. We're going to see a cameo appearance by a contravariant functor. So we're going to talk here about data conversion from one schema to another. Um, so suppose you have a database that represents an instance of a database schema in in category D, okay? Um, and suppose that we want to map that, so it's, it's a database schema, excuse me, it's an instance of a database schema um, associated with category D. And um, that's a lot of words, but what I'm, what I'm saying is category D encodes the database schema objects or tables and morphisms or foreign key relation morphism between two different objects or foreign key relationships um but uh, that's the database schema d 
but we're saying we have an instance of that database, which is a, a morphous, oh, excuse me, a functor from D to, to set, okay? Um, so we have, we have an instance, it's, and it's an example of applying the results of this functor, okay? Um, so now suppose we want to get the data that's represented, created by this functor, and we want to bring it into a different database schema, C. Okay? Um, so, um, this, is, this is an example of a data migration need, right? We have the data in one form, and we want to get it into another form. Um, now, it, it's tempting to immediately start to think, well, okay, we need to have a, a recipe for mapping from Ds to Cs. And what's a little bit counterintuitive is we're going to actually have the opposite here. Um, and I use that word advisedly. Um, we're going to have a functor representing mapping from C, the one we want to get it into, forgive the English, um, to D, the one it's in now. Um, and this functor from C to D um, is going to allow us to, to to sort of hoist the data from D into C, okay? And the mechanism here is known as a pullback, okay? Now, turns out that the term pullback is used in a more general sense as well a lot in category theory. And it's a beautiful sense. Um, and we will encounter it. It's a type of limit, um, um, it's, it involves a universal construction. It's kind of the best way um, to to be defining uh, something, given that you have to keep uh, two um, um, two functions uh, or morphisms involving it equal. Um, and um, and this pullback, we're gonna is gonna provide us with this way to convert the data database instance for D into a, data, a corresponding database instance for C. And the idea here is, is to engage in composition, okay? It turns out functors can be composed. And this is going to point us to something a little bit deeper, which Brendan Fong mentioned in one of the videos I asked you to watch. Um, and we'll get to. It has to do with the fact that... Um, that uh, we can have a category of small categories and functors or morphisms in that. Um, but the idea here is that any two functors can be composed. You say, what do you mean compose a functor? Well, remember, a functor consists of, of mappings, mapping with objects to objects and morphisms to morphisms. Um, and... Um, if, if we're dealing with small categories, categories that are non-infinite in size particularly, these are just functions. These are functions. Um, and we can compose functions, so why can't we compose functors? Uh, we can. And, and generally, it's quite easy to compose functors. So if, if we have functors i and f, and, and I remember i here is this one from d to set, that's the that's the functor that creates a database instance of D. Okay, um, that's I. And F is the functor from C to D. To D. Yeah. Um, we can compose those. Uh, well, to, to compose them, they have to be, can you line them up end to end? Are they compatible? Yeah, they are. F goes from C to D. I goes from D to set. So we can compose them. All right, um, we can get something that goes from C to set um, by by lining them up end to end and just doing F first and uh, and then I. F will map it from C to D and then D from D to set. And, and so we can write as F. This should be a fat semicolon, sorry. Sorry, I, I lapsed. Um, and then I. Um, or we can write as I composition F. Um, and, and the results of this, nonetheless, is something that gives us a functor. By, by composing these two functors, we 
we now have a functor from C to Z. We had a functor from D to Z. By pre-composing that with C to D, we have something from C to Z that represents an instance of the database schema C. Okay, it it, it captures uh, what it means for C to have a, a a database instance. Now, okay. Um, now, the thing that's notable here may stand out is uh, an exemplar of a general phenomenon. We have here something that seems almost backwards. Um, after all, we want to get it the data from an instance of D to an instance of C. And somehow it seems like we have this backwards thing. We, we have it in D. We want to get it in C. Shouldn't the arrow from that we want go from D to C? Um, and um, it's tempting to think that way. But in this case, we are, are not doing that. And it's a reflection of a, of a contravariance um, here. And I, I want to dive into this for a few minutes. Um, and I'm, I may give you an exercise for next time to go through this yourself a little bit and, and help you think through it. Okay, so we've talked about functors in general. And um, the truth is I've oversimplified the situation a bit, okay? Um, and um, specifically, there's some aspects of the... Um, of the definition, a very particular set of aspects of the definition, um, where I've glossed over some things um, about how we use the term functors. It's really how we use the term. What do we mean by it? How specific are we? Because it turns out that what I'm really describing here is something called covariant functors, okay? Now, this is kind of what people mean if they don't associate a word with it most of the time, but sometimes, often they'll use that term in a general term that involves not just covariant functors, but contravariant. Um, uh, so I want, to, um, uh, I want to talk about covariant functors and how they differ from contravariant functors, okay? Um, so um, let's, let's talk, to do this, I want to make it concrete. I, I, I don't want to deal just with abstractions. We could look at the definition of contravariant functors, but it's going to seem kind of weird without seeing maybe some motivation. So, so let's consider covariant functors. In the lectures by Bartosz Mielewski particularly, um, you will have seen that we capture covariant functors within Haskell um, they're associated with an fmap operation, right? And what does fmap do? Well, we talk about how it lifts a function um, uh, so that if we have a functor, let's say list of s, list of s, and we ask about, and I've kind of written this in a Scala type notation, um, just, uh, just to sort of uh, speak to some people from different backgrounds. Uh, but I could have said list s uh, with a, with a lowercase and without the brackets um, in more of a Haskell type dialect. Um, I do kind of like uh, well in any case. Um, uh, so here, uh, fmap would be lifting say a function going from s to t so that it operates on lists. So if we have a function that maybe maybe we have a list of ints and we have a function that maps ints to doubles, right? Um, um, then if we have a function that maps ints to doubles, we can lift it to apply to lists of ints to get lists of doubles out. And that's conceptually, we're applying the functor list to that function through this fmap operation to lift that function, lift that morphism so that it operates on the uh, the results of applying that that functor to objects. So we map ints to list of ints. We map doubles to lift list of doubles with the functor. And if we have a mapping from ints to doubles, a function, we lift that function with the same functor to go from list of int to list of double. All right. Um. And look, we. How do we apply that? Well, generally, we 
apply this function to the data available. Um, you know, if we have something goes from insta doubles as our function, um, and we have a list of ints, we to get a list of doubles, we just go through and we apply it to each of the ints in the original list, a list of ints, and we got out a list of doubles. It's not a lot of fuss or muss about it. With something like maybe, we maybe even don't have something there, in which case it's nothing and we get back nothing. But if we have something there, like a maybe event, with the function, we can apply the function to it, which maps ints to doubles, and we'll get a, a maybe of doubles, right? So it's it's quite easy. So for lift, listing, uh, lifting of, of f for lists, um, for each element in the list, we just apply f to it to get back something that's a t, right? If we have this function from s to t. Or for these maybes, we could do it. Now, I want to deal with this case here, just to build a bit of intuition which we're going to take advantage of in the in the contravariant case here in less than five minutes so let's suppose we had a a maybe of functions so we don't have a, a maybe of ints but suppose we have a a maybe of um um a maybe of uh of of functions from ints to s. So these are functions which take an int in and they return an s. And we have a function from s to t. Um, and we want to turn this into a maybe of int to t. Okay, so, so we start with a maybe of int to s and we want to get out a maybe of int to t. And the question is, can we apply this function that we have from s to t to help us get there? And the answer is, yeah, we can. Um, um, so, so look, um, uh, we can take the function that we have here. So if, the, if, if maybe holds a nothing, we return a nothing. If the maybe holds a value, the value is of type int to s, right? Um, it's a function. And we can take that function and we can apply it um, to an int and get out an s. Uh, and um, so if we're given an int, we can get an S back, and then we can apply F to get it, go from that S to the T, and the net result is we've gotten uh, something from int to T. So, so we can turn that, if we have a maybe into S, we can create a maybe of int to T from it. And the same thing with a list of int to S. We could go through each of those and... Um, and create a function that's an int to t by just composing these two functions f and uh, and uh, g um, uh, in turn g can then compose with f okay um, we could just go through uh, and compose so I, I recognize this is um, uh, this is going to be uh, a little bit involved to think about but do people get the basic idea of that that if we have this, say, a list of, of functions which are which give a value of s, and we have something, a function that we've been given for fmap that we want to lift to apply to that list, and this function we're given goes from s to t, we can get at back this list of functions to t. Does that make sense to people? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's that's good. Um, being conscious of time, um, um, I want to talk about this now. So this is covariant functors. I want to talk about it for contravariant functors, okay? Because now, now you'll see why you need them in, in a programming context, okay? So suppose we have something that nominally seems very similar to this case, to list of int to s or maybe of int to s. We're going to have 
Just the reverse. It seems so innocuous. A list of S to int, or a list, a maybe of S to int. So instead of being int to S, we have S to int. Okay? Um, that's the only difference. Now, the problem is, suppose we're given a function from S to T. Um, uh, how can we... How can we, if we were given a function from S to T, how could we go get something that's T to int? So if we're, if we're given a list of, of these S to ints, consider a given one of those. We have something takes in an S. It needs an S, and it gives back an int. And I want to lift that. I want to lift that function so it, 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 can, it can operate from T to ints. Um, uh, for each of these elements of this list. Well, look, um, this is a, a challenging thing, right? Because I've something which this function I'm given mapping from S to T, um, and that's all fine and good, but um, but the, um, uh, you know, here we, how do we end up applying it? Well, let's, let's consider trying to lift it, right? We have... Um, this list of s to ints, and we want to turn it into a list of t to ints. And we have this function going from s to t. Let's consider a given element to this list. It's a function from s to int, right? That's what's inside of this list. How do we apply something that goes from an s to a t to map to map this to a to a t to an int? Um, uh, well, we we can't directly because. Um, after all, this is a function which takes something in that's an S, um, and we want to turn it into something that takes something in that's a T. Um, and if we can turn S's into T's, uh, th I mean, that's all nice and good, but it's not going to help us here because uh, what we want to do is we want to take something that needs an S and turn it into something that needs a T. Um, we, it's not like we have an S and we want to turn it into a T. We, we want to get something that needs a T um, to, to, to operate, that the T is, is required by it. Um, but if we have the reverse, if we have something that takes in a T and returns an S, now we're in business because if we had something originally that takes an S and returns an end, we can turn it into something that takes a T and returns an int because we have this magic transformer that if I get a T, I can turn it into an S and then I could feed it into this function and have something which end to end maps T to ints. Um, and that uh, is allows me to uh, to turn this uh, into a, a to a T to an int to to lift it in this way. So a contravariant functor um, is basically going to, when I'm trying to get rid of this, and unfortunately I have to bow out here in about uh, one or two minutes. So a covariant functor, darn these little uh, widgets at the bottom, a covariant, oh gosh, a covariant functor is going to have this fmap operation, and it's going to it's going to lift something from s to t into something that's f of s to f of t, right? So if f is list, it's gonna take in a function that's s to t, and it's gonna turn it into a function that goes from lists of s to lists of t. Great, that's a that's a covariant function. It should be familiar, right? Um, or if f is maybe, we could take in a function that goes s to t and, and turn it into something that goes from maybe of s to maybe of t. We talked about that earlier. But a, a co... A, oh, my gosh. This should be contravariant functor down here. Contravariant. And, of course, everything gets messed up here. Um, contravariant functor um, there. Um, uh, here. Um, a contravariant functor will instead take in something that's a T to an S. It's the reverse. Um and, uh, or, yeah, you could think of it as taking a T to an S and then lifting an F of, uh, F of S to an F of T. Or alternatively, you could think of it as taking an S to a T and producing something that's F of T to F of S, okay? So, so here, what's contra about it 
is that it's in the reverse order of the results. So if we take in an S to a T, we lift it to be something that's the functor of T uh, to the functor of S. Um, the function goes from F, F of T to F of S. Or if we get in something that's T to S, then we return something that's the reverse, F of S to F of T. So uh, this has been a bit of a whirlwind thing but the basic deal is um, there are times where we don't have an S. We, instead, we're dealing with something like a function that needs an S. And we can't turn that into a T by applying a function to it because we, don't, we, don't, we, we, we can't turn it into something that needs a T by just applying a function that maps S to T. Instead, we need to have a function that turns T's into S's. And then we can turn something that needs an S into something that needs a T by just getting that T, passing it to this thing that maps T to S, and using the thing we already have that maps S to, to int, um, in this case, or uses, uh, that needs the, the S. So this is the idea of contravariant functors. They, and a contravariant functor in general is going to be a covariant functor from C op. So a contravariant functor from C, from a category C to uh, another category D is gonna be a covariant functor from C op. The opposite, it's just the same category, but all the arrows flipped in direction. They're the same functions if they're functions. They're the same morphisms if, for other types of morphisms. It's just we regard them as being in the opposite direction. Um, and and uh, a contravariant functor is a functor which uh, maps from C op to D instead of from C to D, okay? So a um, uh, contravariant functor um, is something which um, is very common. It'll come up in a lot of cases. We saw a cameo appearance uh, of it just a few moments ago in this, in this um, uh, pullback notion um, where we would have thought we need something that maps D to C but all we need is something that's C to D and we see it in a programming context here. So I'm going to ask you to undertake an exercise to further this and we can discuss confusions about it next time. Okay, I have to get across town. Uh, I apologize for bowing out when there's probably questions brimming but I will look forward to, um, to getting you the exercise and talking further about these concepts in a good discussion section um, at, uh, for the first half of next class. Thanks very much, and have a great day there, folks. Take care.